So in this video, we will look at the second group of mammalian orders. And we're only going to look at a handful of those orders today, but, you know, got to stay busy. So this is going to be where we're going to uh, be looking at the placentals. And the placentals are a group of mammals that have this placenta which connects the offspring to the mother for the internal development of the offspring. The first group of placentals that we'll look at is the order Insectivora. These are insect-eating mammals like shrews and hedgehogs and moles. They are known for their small, sharp snout. And when I say sharp, I don't mean like a knife. Just came, They come to a point. These animals spend a great part of their lives underground. They're distributed throughout the world except Australia and New Zealand. So they're not in that part of the world as opposed to the marsupials, which are all over there. The shrews are among the smallest known mammals, very small mammals, approximately 440 species. The next order are called Chiroptera, and these are bats. Uh, bats are the only f true flying mammals in that they can actually sustain flight as opposed to just gliding. And their wings, I don't think I have an extra picture of their wings. This is a good one here on the right. Their wings are just a modified forelimb in which the second to the fifth digits, so basically everything but your thumb, if you want to look at it that way, support these membranes for flying. And so as you can look there on the right, their wings are mostly just their hands and the connection between their hand and their foot having this thin membrane, which allows them to stay flight and that stay in flight. And that first digit then is used kind of like a claw for grabbing things like you would expect it to be. The old world tropics in the other part of the world, on the other side of the world, there are these um, fruit bats, and they're, they're also called flying foxes. And there's a picture of one right there. These are the largest of all bats. They have a wingspan of like a meter and a half. So that's like eight feet, really long. They, uh, not eight feet, five feet. They ch live chiefly on fruits, but there are almost a thousand species of bats. We have several in this part of the country. The next order is Xenartha. These are anteaters, armadillos, and everyone's favorite, the sloth. These are either toothless, like the anteater, or they just have very simple peg-like teeth like sloth and armadillos. They mostly live in Central and South America. Let's see if I have a picture. Yes, I do. But the nine-banded armadillo, which we are familiar with here, has become common to the southern part of the United States and is actually spreading north. When I was young, there weren't armadillos in this part of the world, but now there are, and they're pretty common. They'll actually just come up in my yard. They're not afraid of you. Um, and they are actually known to spread leprosy. So don't go handling armadillos. The next order is the lagomorphs. And these are rabbits, hares, and a group of mammals called pikas. These have long incisors. These are the front two teeth. And they're always growing, almost like a plant. And so the way that they deal with them is they're constantly paring them down. They're sh they sharpen them, very similar to rodents. Um, and lagomorphs are all herbivores, and they're all over the place. So they have a very cosmopolitan-type distribution, meaning that they're found all over the world. And there's the pika, which I'm not sure exactly how that's related to a rabbit, but there you go. And the last word that we'll look at today is called rodentia, and these are rodents. This is typically how we would define them, is by saying these are gnawing mammals, like squirrels and rats and woodchucks. These are the most numerous of all mammals, over 2,000 species, and there are just a lot of them numerically as well, characterized by 
two pairs of chisel-like incisors that grow throughout their life, and they are adapted for this kind of chewing where they're constantly just gnawing on different things. These have a, they're known for their very impressive reproductive rate and their adaptability. They are able to invade nearly all terrestrial habitats. And they're typically of great ecological importance because they represent that low level of feeding. That, that the lowest level of feeding that has to do with eating uh, or other animals eating them. We're going to look at a couple of different families in this group. Scuriidae, these are squirrels and woodchucks. Then there's the Muridae, these are like rats and house mice. Castoridae, these are beavers, extremely important um, part of forest ecosystems and aquatic ecosystems, oftentimes making an aquatic ecosystem. You can see really well here these two pairs of incisors that they spend a lot of their time uh, keeping sharp so that they can eat trees. They literally do eat trees. There's porcupines. I'll let you figure out the pronunciation of that one. Geomaya Day, which I don't have a picture of Geomaya Day. This is gophers. And um, Cresseta Day, this is like ham hamsters and gerbils and those sorts of things. So again, very important uh, species and group of species because they represent that low level, um, not necessarily a primary consumer, secondary consumer, in which a lot of larger mammals feed on. If these go away, the whole ecosystem basically shuts down.